Downhearted. Downhearted. Never really started. Peeps, the knockoff is back. We've had a one week uh, sabbatical, we'll call it, I guess. We're, uh, sabbatical. We're back in the uh, Julia Street studios. It's Friday, 2nd of September. Coming at you for another edition of the knockoff. In the house is our regular Danny. What up, man? What's up, people? And we're joined by a guest today, a uh, very special guest. We've got 2010 Commonwealth Games 100 meter Paralympic gold medalist and a 2012 London Paralympic silver medalist, Simon Patmore. What up, buddy? Hey, mate. How good. you doing? <laughs> What's going on, dog? We're doing good. It's good to have you on, man. Simon's been a long-term friend of ours, and we've watched him sort of through his journey, so we think you'd be a nice, intriguing guest to sit back and soothe your ears for an hour. We're going to pick his brain over some shit, and we'll be up on iTunes as per usual. We've been pretty fucking stoked with the shout-out so far with the iTunes. and uh, Episode keep... 7, dude. That's it, man. We're here. <laughs> That's it. We have, we've had plenty of feedback during the week, too, regarding the iTunes. It's fucking... Nice and easy for you to have sit back and have a listen and to be able to listen to it offline and not necessarily have to be connected to iTunes. So however you're listening to this shit, whether you're driving in your car on your way home to work, way home from work, wherever you're going, fuck yeah, don't you? <laughs> 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 Just wherever lost that. You yeah, yeah, where, wherever it. you're going, like wherever the fuck I was going with that. But <laughs> we've got... Uh, toast one. Straight toast on. One. Yeah, to- toast one indeed. We've got... Uh, Straight off the top, you know we always touch base on our, on our UFC current events up in this bitch. Danny, McGregor versus Diaz. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. I know, I know it's two weeks ago now, but mm, this is the first mm. time we've touched base on it since. Well, I think it's, uh, it's important to say that um, you take away the bragging rights for calling a three, three, uh, five-round decision to McGregor. I mean, not everybody would have been going that call. So uh, Absolutely. You, Ab- went, you went out there and... Uh, you got the bragging rights, big dog. That's it. I'll, I'll, t- I'll take it this time. It's fucking picking fights is always a really hard thing to do where you're talking out of your ass because until you actually see it, you don't know what can happen. Like we can have Cobain on that card. You're talking about a barn burner between Glover and then you get a 13 second KO to a guy like Rumble. So that can happen in MMA. Uh, so I went all out with the five round decision call and fuck man, I'm going into the fight. I didn't think Connor had a fight like that in him and, take my hat off to that guy he, he gutted it out and got the decision and he faced some adversity in that fight too and uh like not like the first one you know he got tired and then shot for that takedown but this time like his coach said he either win or you learn and he fucking learned dan yeah yeah i think um fuck man he uh it seemed like it was going the exact same way as the first fight he looked sharp as fuck in the beginning and he was just landing heaps of shots Dropped like he him. had yeah yeah the leg kicks as well, the the leg kick game plan, like that was perfect. And Huge. Uh, and then I think it was around the third, man, it just looked like he started to gas and, th- and then it looked like, fuck, he might be getting wobbled here with a few mm. of these shots from Nate. Like, but grinded it out. I mean, <clears throat> you could have given it to either fighter, really. Nobody could have been up in arms if, if Nate got the decision as well. But That's yeah, I don't it. know. I don't think... Um, I think those early rounds clinched it for McGregor for mine. Definitely. I think round two was the one that was the most up for debate because Nate, as you said, like when Connor started to show signs of fatigue in that last so round, he round sort of, two. yeah, he sort of poured True. it on him. But for the first three minutes of that round, Connor had dropped Nate twice on the feet and intelligently didn't go into the ground. He wanted none of that. Each time he'd sort of dropped him, he didn't rush in to try and finish mm. him because he knows mm. how tough Nate is. And yeah. For the 25 minutes, looking back, I'd love to watch the fight again because it felt like there was a pace there was an absolute pace for that. The amount of volume that was thrown, I haven't seen the fight metrics, but did you see the fight, Simon? It, it was busy, man. Nah, mate. I didn't see it whatsoever, but I um, got the highlights, which it oh, always yeah. counts in that. Dude, we've oh, just recapped it there for you, so yeah, fucking yeah. Th- there it is. But, but um, the big ticket, I guess, now with the fucking McGregor situation is there's a whole bunch of rumours around a fight with GSP. There is. At 170, it's that's... P- that's, in my opinion, a really fucking tough night at the office for Connor. It's huge, huge. I think that's... Facing a guy with an excellent takedown, excellent wrestling, who's known to control guys for entire fights. And, uh, and we've seen that, you know, Connor's strengths are in his striking. And, um, yeah, fuck, I don't know. But that's his business model, man. You know, he goes for those big money fights. And, and that's about the biggest money fight that he could possibly sign on for at, at this stage. 100% it is. You're talking, if these guys got 
three million and two million respectively for the main event at two oh two in terms of show money, they'll get the pay per view points and they'll probably get closer to eleven or thirteen million respectively. Yeah. And I if think you make that fight with George, you can ask for a six, seven exactly, mil show. Man, exactly. Money. And strategy wise, it's fucking smart because if he fights George at fucking one seventy and loses, which, you know, probably if you if you check him with the bookies, he's gonna be he's gonna be the underdog a in big, that fight. A big underdog, you're dead right. And if he loses that fight, he can still go back to featherweight and lightweight and potentially ch- challenge for titles and still call out a whole bunch of fighters and make make heaps more bank. But if you're comparing sort of his option at the moment to fight Eddie Alvarez for the lightweight title versus a fucking essentially a freak fight at one seventy against George George Saint Pierre, then um, you know you know which one's fucking paying more. It's a no brainer, absolutely. Even if it wasn't, you don't get that sort of fairy tale Madison Square Garden card where they're predicting McGregor versus Alvarez might occur. This guy's Connor is a money driven guy. He loves making that cheddar. The cheddar makes it better for Connor. And as you say, there's no bigger fight that they could make at one seventy for him and He's got got nothing to lose as such. He, mm. like if mm. he's if he gets taken down and grinded out by Saint Pierre, Connor just can fall back on going, "Oh, I'm a lightweight. I'm a 45." He loses no credibility by doing it. Yeah. Except from the haters, but that's always going to happen. But in terms of talking about career options as well, the card from last weekend, headlined by Damian Maya, Carlos Condit. Where to now for Carlos? If for those that for those that didn't see the fight, uh, Damian Maya just jiu-jitsu stud there's probably no better jiu-jitsu practitioner on the roster at the minute took Carlos down inside 90 seconds and had him by a rear naked choke so just looked fucking heavy man like just moving through him like butter you know just super fucking heavy top position and just went for it and I think um you know after the the Robbie Lawler fight Carlos was making sort of talk in his post-fight press conference as to whether you know this was the place for him anymore and Mm. And I think he's a smart guy and he's not going to stick around and be a gatekeeper at, at a mid-tier level and just accrue heaps more brain damage. I think he'll he'll get out of it and explore other options for, you know, fucking earning a living essentially if you're not going to be champion. But um, it's, it's yeah, it's just one of those situations where I guess it's just a timing issue and whoever comes along in, in that division at that time. But Carlos Condit is a bad motherfucker, man. He is, he is one of the fucking best fighters on the planet at the moment, like hands down. An entertainer. I, I can't help but think we might see him one more time just because he's known for putting on a show an absolute barn yeah. burner fights. He's see there, what they can set up for him. See if they can make something entertaining for him and that yeah. way he can ride off into the sunset with a slugfest rather than just being taken down he, and he grinded out. He came really fucking close to beating GSP. He, he beat did. the fucking shit out of him, he, like busted up. That was the fight that GSP looked like the fucking elephant man in the press conference afterwards. Eh? There was so many. Because George with that top and game Carlos against looked Conor, sweet. Carlos was fine, man. Yeah. He he went to the party. George went to the hospital. Like yeah. it was one one of those type of fights. And Carlos, that's what I was going to say too. In the, in that fight, Carlos off his back was landing elbows, which fucked him up. And I think that's what makes it such a big thing for Damian Maya, the way he just breezed through him like that. Because Carlos is a fucking murderer on the ground, man. He didn't. He survived twenty five minutes against George. Got taken yeah, down. Looked for submissions. Everything. Deadly off his back too. Yeah, deadly yeah. off his back. Looked to look real comfortable on the ground against his five rounder against Nick Diaz. Like you're talking high level ground guys, and Maya has just come along and fucking Next level sliced through him. So, for yours, Dan, would you prefer? As a as a UFC marketing point, I think you still probably have to give that title shot to Wonder Boy. Absolutely, and I don't think fucking the prospect of a Wonder Boy fight is ever a boring thing. You know, no, he, he's a fucking savage as well. So he, he's well and truly arrived on the scene. And if you're looking at a setting up a five round barn burner against a guy like Tyron Woodley, you choose Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson because he's like watching a fucking video game character out there. Like he mm. just. He's so dynamic and I think out of pure entertainment value for casual fans to get on board and in a pay-per-view model, it's Wonder Boy versus Woodley next up. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. I think so. Oh, man, that, that division is fucking stacked at the moment. Eh? It's funny how, like, uh, you know, it'll seem like a division is stagnant for a time and there's nothing that exciting going on in it and then the next minute you've got a fucking log jam where... 
Damien Meyer is a bad fight for any of those guys, uh, man. Very much so. And Robbie yeah. Lawler has been such a fucking dominant champion yeah. and been in some crazy fucking wars. You got when you, you well, that's case in point. When you've got a guy like Carlos that fucking is gatekeeping, then that's how fucking stacked your division stacked is. Up. Speaking of, uh, you mentioned Robbie Lawler's name there. There's fucking bit of shit around this week about the potential for a Robbie Lawler Donald Cowboy Cerrone fight because Cerrone was on that. 202 pay-per-view and landed this four-punch combination to put away Rick Story, who's a, a tough out for anyone at that division. So that Donald can basically ask for what he wants now at that weight class. Yeah. Can you imagine a slugfest between Cerrone and Robbie Lawler? Fuck Fucking yeah. hell. Dude. Did you listen to the um, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast with... Uh the I latest have, one with Cowboy. I have him up to date. I fucking yeah. he, after his first one, I just had to listen to this again. Like he's just a wild motherfucker, man. He yeah, does, he I'm does about sh- halfway through, but they just touched on the fact that like he's got a big fight, but that it's not like he's mm. not totally able to fucking That's right, talk yeah. about it yet. They've done the photos and shit too. They hinted right. at that. They're like, look, he's done the photo shoot and everything, so we just got to do a few little more adjustments to it, and we'll book it. And that fight is rumored to be at Madison Square Garden, so. You can bet your ass that they'll stack a main card for that pay-per-view. The first one at Madison Square Garden, New York City. They've been trying to crack it for so long. If they can get that for November, that might be the most stacked card that they've yeah. had for this year. And that's saying something because they've had yeah. some serious cards this yeah. year. Yeah, it was like 200 though. It's like it's too early to fucking call what, what could potentially be on that card. There's so much big shit that they could try and make. I've heard fucking Ronda's name be thrown into the equation as well, but it's too far out with injuries and, and matches coming up to really call. But yeah, that, was, that was with 200. All of the incidents that happened there relating to Jones and everything like that, that happened in fight week too. We thought yeah. we were there and three days before exactly. the fight... It all changed. Exactly. That, there's a fucking weird, weird old card that. So I hope for the for the UFC sake that 205 goes a little bit better than for 200 because it is just as monumental for them. So. Man, I think um, we need to get like a little podcast esky or something for the table because every time I have to get up to get a beer, I have to leave the mic so and did, did look for a bottle opener. Didn't muck shit. around on that one. Yeah, it's just the uh, the Bitburger, the uh, German premium beer. That's bitburger.ge. <laughs> Excuse me, what's your uh, cheapest yeah. six pack? Yeah. <laughs> Get some of these bitburgers. That's bitburger.ge slash knockoff. Ten percent off any and all craft. Oh, beer. but I was I was <laughs> fucking. <laughs> I was thinking today, man, listening to that uh, cowboy podcast because he's sponsored by Budweiser. And uh, he's talking about, oh, Joe, I'll get your fucking, I'll get your keys sent to your house and shit. And it's just like, how fucking sick would it be to be sponsored by a beer company and you could just, you know, any stage you could get a fucking carton delivered or oh, hit your mates up or... A crate, man. Just boom, there you go. There's 10 slabs. Does well, anyone want a beer? Uh, how about you, Simon? Well, while yeah. you're there, it's, yeah. while you're there okay. it saves up. I'll do, the, I'll do the round. Stretching your legs again. <laughs> fucking A. So while Dan's off just getting some drinks for us, we're talking about professional athletics and UFC, obviously blessed by fucking high-level athletes. We've got one in the studio today. I mentioned mentioned off the top that Simon Patmore's in the house. We've got – he's been a long-term friend of ours and we've been along for the ride with him and through – what is it now? How long is your sort of athletic career now? It'd probably the, uh, be the best, pa- best part of eight yeah, years. Yeah, eight years. From the top, Simon uh, competed in the 100-metre sprint in athletics at the 2010 Delhi Commonwealth Games, brought home a gold medal. Uh, do you remember what time you were in? Uh, yeah, it was actually a PB. Fuck so yeah. So I was pretty stoked with it. It was 11.25. Shit. PB under the brightest lights yeah. too, son. Yeah. So. Oh, no, it was 11.19, actually. 11.19. Wind assisted, though. Yeah. It. Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Not much, but That's still. All right. That's all right. So from there, you progressed to the... 2012 London Paralympics and took home a silver, but it was a, a bronze. A bronze, yeah, is that bronze. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Snuck out. Um, I had this big Cuban guy come out from nowhere and just took me on on the bend and from yeah. Cuba. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're, I think it's probably best if we work in chronological order with Simon. We've both attended high school with him, and Danny and I were talking off air earlier, and we we're intrigued as to when the athletic dream first became possible for you. Well, when we, did fucking... Because I remember um, the AIS was sort of chasing you a little bit through school and you were sort of putting them off weren't you, at one point. Yeah, like in year 12, I was doing some um, Paralympic sort of uh, testing almost um, and that's where I f- found my um, athletics coach. But 
Uh, basically, they were scouting for the 2006 Commonwealth Games in right. Melbourne. Right. And um, there was a 200 event for me there. Um, but, yeah, such a young age. 17. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'd be eight, 18, oh, eight, you would have been 18 in 06, 18, 19 um, years old. At the stage, I was 17. Yeah. But I started, yeah... Just, Started at when I turned 17. Well, so yeah. so they, they dangled that carrot in front of you, essentially. And did you sort of by hearing those opportunities and seeing the program that was available to you, did you say, look, fuck it, I'm, I'm going to have a go at this? Well, you you would have held off for a few years because, sorry, I'll let, you, I'll let you talk. Well, see, for me, I've always been a um, team player and I love team sports and athletics was not anything yeah. to do with that. So... Yeah. I've been brought up in soccer and rugby and cricket and throughout the whole of school years, I just wanted to participate in it and didn't that's care. It. That's just mateships and camaraderie of team sport. Well, that's yeah. how it works, man. Yeah, so when I was starting at 17 and doing, you know, four by 100s by myself and like there was a team, but it was all such an individual mm-hmm. sport, it, I knew it wasn't for me. Like... I knew I had talent at the time, but like it just wasn't for me. So I gave it a go and left it. Yeah, it's like one of those things, I guess, if you're going to fucking perform at that level, you need to commit yourself fully to it. Oh, you know, you yeah. can't be fucking half assing it if it's like, you know, I'm uh, not really that into this. So fucking my mates are going to the fucking beach this weekend. Exactly. I want to party. Like Exactly. The, all the all the guys just turned 18. Everyone's going to the club fucking three nights a week. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'm out here fucking running as hard as I fucking can for 11 seconds at a time. Like that dedication requires a specific person or maturity. Yeah, which maturity was, is right. Which yeah. is exactly fucking what it was in your case. So at what point did you, during this testing time, were you running quick enough times where they were able to give you an incentive and say, hey, fuck man, if you just t- shave another point three off this time, you can run an A qualifier? Yeah, essentially, um, when we got scouted, we got sent down to AIS to one of the head coaches to see what we've got. Is that Canberra? Yeah, that was in Canberra. Um, and then they... Mad facilities down there. Uh, definitely like world class and that's what you need. Yeah. Um, and it's always enjoyable going down there, but like living down there, that would be another big Why question. Why Canberra? Why fucking Canberra? Who goes, who goes there to do capital anything? Capital of Australia. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, but that's a fucking whole other podcast, but why too? That's yeah, fucking, yeah. come on, man. Well, Canberra's, yeah, it's yeah. fucking... Not know, that I've been yeah. there, but from what I hear, it's just this little yeah. spot in the middle of nowhere. See, that's Me neither. I've never yeah. been, so I'm talking it out of my ass entirely, <laughs> but from what I've heard, I ain't going to that And uh, Canberra's under yeah. the bus this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you too, Adelaide. <laughs> I've never been there either. <laughs> Uh, I ain't mad at you, Adelaide. You know we fucking touch and base with our South Australian listeners. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't think we've heard from anybody yeah. in uh, in SA yet, yeah. but if you're out there, yeah. shout out. Come on, <laughs> slide into that DM. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, at, at what? So did they say like during the training? Fuck Simon, you've got something here. Keep working at it, and there is potential to go to that. Yeah. So there was about six, seven athletes down there at that time, and we're all probably age seventeen to about twenty-one. And um, I got picked out of all that seven to say, like, there is an event for you and you do have talent, but you've got to be committed. And um, when you go to, um, like, the AOS, it's kind of like you're intimidated by what is actually you're confronted by because Mm -hmm. it's, like, massive gyms that you would never see, like, at your normal club. Um, But then all the other facilities, whether it's gyms, tracks, recovery center, um, you know it's an institution. So you've got to be, you know, 100%. Um, At that age, I just couldn't make, I didn't really understand it. Mm. So I was just like, okay, I'll let it go kind of thing. Um, But, you know, I gave it a crack with through like three or four months worth of training. The problem was is that my training was over at... um, at QE2 and I was in year 12 so I yeah. had to drive all the way from Shawncliffe all the way out to QE2 nearly yeah, every day so that's it. 50 minute drive after school and traffic there's that dedication and maturity for yeah you. you need to really want that so yeah. do you remember when uh did you to post a qualifying time did you have to run at track meets around the country in order to do that yeah, so there is a criteria into like leading into like big competitions like Commonwealth Games and then Paralympic Games and stuff, and you're entailed to like obviously make the qualification time, which is your A or B time, 
and then you also um, have to select the criteria so you've got to be at certain events and there is on the east coast mainly on the east coast of australia um we've got grand prix which happens in brisbane you yep. you were there for that one um and then it goes all the way down to sydney and melbourne and um once you meet that criteria and meet your times that's when you can yep. kind of you know what uh what's the difference between an a time and a b time when talking f- to trying to qualify okay um particularly in a lot well in generally in all sports let's look at able body for example like if you're a 100 meter sprinter and you want to go to the olympics you have to be running like tens yep. and low low tens like 1008 and yep. then 101 um you know that's your a qualifier and then b qualifier you'd probably move back to like still low 10s but it's you know it can vary you can go to 10 2 yep. but you've run 5 10 2 so it's like so, so such could, a yeah. crazy fucking sport that it comes down to just these tiny decimal fractions of a fucking oh, man. second you can, yeah spend, spend four years hard out something and you can just mi- to miss it miss yeah. it by Less than a blink of an eye. It's fucking insane, man. Literally by the skin of your teeth. I heard some bitch fucking the other day said that in in a meeting at work and I was just, I I had to bite my lip. Quite literally, eh? Literally literally by the skin of my teeth. I was like, oh, literally, eh? Yeah. yeah. Fuck. I literally died like when I saw it. Yeah, oh man, I fucking (laughs) literally died. It's become like, people are like, oh, grammar police or whatever, but it's become like this misinterpretation of a word like mm, overall bad. people it's are using it to emphasize stuff like i literally fucking did this like it was literally awesome and it's like fucking hell it drives me nuts <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man God. fucking hell no, i'm part of the grammar police i can't stand that sort of shit like do you um simon do you remember when you competed and posted a time leading in towards delhi 2010 um, was there a day where you'd finished yeah. and went, fuck yeah, I got that ticket on the plane, bitches. Yeah, so that was the day when all the boys rocked up. Nice. Right? So that was a big, yep. big day. Um, all my family was there and stuff like that because I don't really like training or competing around like family and friends in small sort of competitions. Yep. Um, but like this one, this was the one where it's like, I'm, tonight I'm booking my ticket yep. and I had okay. to perform. And I, um, for us, the A qualifier was 11-2. And the B qualifier was 11.4. And um, I ran 11.31. So that gave me my um, qu- uh, B qualifier. No, sorry. I. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, it was low standard. So it was 11, um, th- 11 4 to 11.6. So, um, which is very slow in my category as well. Um, but yeah, I got an A qualifier on that night. What do you reckon you'd run, run 100 metres in right now, Bruce? Two beers down. Right now, if I had to go down and run goalpost to goalpost on a conventional you got, football you got, field. You got, no, 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 no. You got proper running spikes. You're on oh, like geez. a proper rubber track with a, with starting blocks and everything like that. They've got full on heat sensitive stopwatch and Start, shit. Starter gun, everything. It's, it's, it's Full it's a, effort, like 100% effort right at this juncture right now we're literally walking outside and doing it what do you reckon is the ultimate fastest time you could run 16.5 16.5 I'll be realistic with it I ain't here to go on the record and talk yeah. to you smack like, I reckon I could yeah I, I, I reckon I, I could get sub 15 when's the last time you <laughs> when's the last time you sprinted 100 it? <laughs> mate I actually I actually do sprints on Saturdays nice yeah, yeah. bang yeah. 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 but um, yeah. no, no idea how far or what sort of times just yeah. go down the park and just move got it out because I work a fucking office job man so I feel like at the very least, that shit is necessary once a week mm. to just go out and move at 100%. You yeah. know what I mean? Full, full volume. That's a good yeah. point, actually. Yeah. I don't mind that. Oh, because like you think about it, you move from a fucking a room to a car to a train. Mm. You're constantly confined. You're couch. moving around in a city. Yeah, to the couch. <laughs> yeah. You just, you know what I mean? Like you can't constantly around people, so you can't fully move. So it, it feels fucking awesome to get out in a big paddock and just like full tilt. Unleash. But yeah, you should warm up and shit because if you just go out after a week of I'd, not doing anything, I'd had, full if, tilt. If I went now to that track out at QE2 where you did the fucking A qualifier, I wouldn't be convinced now of no warm up if I just went, hey, jump in the car, we're going, sprint. 
I'm not convinced that a hammy wouldn't come off the bone or something. Yeah. I'm not yeah. convinced it would. If I had full volume, have you ever had that feeling where you feel like your hamstring is like top to bottom, you can feel your whole hamstring and you've been running along and you can feel like it bows in the middle and it shortens up? Have any of you ever had that? Well, not to um, not to skip to a fucking bad moment in your career, but you potentially lost a medal due to a hammy, wasn't it? Yeah. Simon? Yeah. So in um, London 2012. That was the London one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was running the bend of the 200 final and I blew my hammy on the bend. Like it was like 10 steps out of the blocks and then I felt it go. So and I it dropped you, didn't it? Uh, well, it, what happened is, is that when you're in the first 10 meters, you're in the acceleration stage. So like you can't push any faster than what you've got to. So I was able to accelerate, but then hold for 150 meters all the way that speed. And it was, oh, would have been slowly dropping hell. off, but like that 200, was 200. Yeah. Fuck me. It's that, a long way for sure. That's surely on just adrenaline alone, right? Oh dude. Oh. And that's what I run off. Basically yeah. that's how like the best performances come out. You just, you kind of walk out into the crowd or whatever gets you tingling. And um, yeah, like you could do wicked stuff. On adrenaline <laughs> and months and months of training. And oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I could have adrenaline and get my fucking ass kicked. Yeah, that's it, if you yeah. G yourself up yeah. enough in this yeah. moment, Briss, oh, after two beers, oh. I reckon you're running sub 13. I'm feeling pretty, fucking pretty fired up, man. I'm thinking about it. It's getting the competitive juices. I'll going, punch you man. in the fucking <laughs> gut. <laughs> so that fucking pain out my mum in the head. Uh, like adrenaline. So you get to, you arrive in Delhi for the 2010 Commonwealth Games. What did you think? What went through your head when you walked out of the airport? That, I've always been intrigued to ask mm. you that as well because I've had family members that have been to India yeah. and said it, the culture shock is something that takes an adjustment. Y- yeah, man. Like, um, I've only travelled overseas uh, a couple of times, um, so to experience an international airport, I've, yeah, at that I stage, haven't, yeah, at that stage, jet set yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Um, so I walked in and I was just like, okay, it's kind of like a normal sort of situation, but a little bit more organized because it's like athletes coming off a plane. So they yeah. kind of like closed down a lot of the um, airport for us to go through to our buses. But the airport wasn't too bad. It looked pretty standard. But once you got on the buses and you saw like the big AK-47s like, mm. and you got three guards on there and you're just like every other athlete sitting down in uniform with the lights on, yeah, it, 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 it's kind of like, well, I'm safe, but like, is this, this is, this is a different country. Yeah. Nothing, you know? nothing against India as a population or anything at all, but did it fucking stink? Um, no, we didn't have that problem no. whatsoever. I guess no. it depends where but you go, man. You oh, find, we were isolated, find stinky man. places we were, in, yeah. in a lot of countries. Yeah. Like, we were isolated. Shout out Adelaide. <laughs> 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 but you'd, um... Oh man, fucking! I mean, it's like India is known for the mass amount of slums it oh, has, absolutely. like, and that's why they have such a massive population. Yeah. There's a a huge portion of India's population who aren't even accounted for, so they're potentially the biggest country in the world. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an intelligent way to ask the question I just did. <laughs> 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 oh fuck that up, Ro- Ro- dude! It stink, bro. <laughs> oh, fucking, who's this redneck fucking no. Queenslander? <laughs> Queensland. Oh. Oh, God damn. Yeah. Competing at that... So, you turn up, you go through your training camp. You obviously have to do a, like a heat process to qualify. Does it... Are you let up through visualization exercises or nerve... Like to sort of counteract those nerves? Because it's got to be a big deal competing on a world stage like that. Were you nervous competing? Um, in that sort of sense, I was... Um, I completely changed as like a person that I would really wanted it so nothing in my way was going to bother me whether I'm in a different that. country or anything like that. Got that Conor McGregor mentality. Yeah, I love yeah. that, man. That's a fucking yeah. good answer. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it was. So you put in the work so it's well, like, yeah, I was 100% to, yeah. confident. I'm here to yeah. do a job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, that's it. That's yeah, it, that's, that's 100%. Cool. Um, so, you know, like you got into the village and then you see your room and it's... It's not what you think it is or you don't really think what... You don't know what to expect, basically. But, like, you know, I didn't have 
pillows or blankets or anything like that. And like, and the aircon was on sixteen. All the, all the Olympians are probably coming all over them at the fucking <laughs> Olympic <laughs> Village fucking well, fuck fest. They're like, man, we ran out of pillows, blankets, everything. All they did was fuck. Yeah. Uh, allegedly. Well, yeah, allegedly, yeah. Well, no, nah, Com Games is all mixed in with the Paralympic sports. Right. So oh, it's the one, one big fuck fest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah bang. Uh, when you like. I've been in the Paralympic village and just be like, okay, that's cool. But one of my rememberable times is definitely at the Commonwealth Games because I'm nice. mixed in with like all the big names nice. like and all from different country, well, Commonwealth countries. Yeah. And, uh, yeah so that's Pommies, Scots, fucking... Yeah. Oh, but you, list, go, list goes mm. on and on for that. But So how does it work with like your event is the T46 100 metres. So how does it work with like how many different types of 100 metre... Um, categories are there right. and, and what is is t46 like a partial limb disability is right. that what it's classified as or so how it works is that you got your t's and your f so track and field right so if you're an f 46 you're throwing a discus or a javelin if you're a t46 you're doing the one and 200 meters right. on the track um and then it quickly goes if you look at it it's kind of like You've got your T20s, which are your um, intellectual disabilities. Right. Your T30s, which is your cerebral palsies. Your T40s is your amputee category. Right. And your T50s is your wheelchair ca- um, right. category. Right. So then you look into subcategories where it's like T44 is like leg amputee. So your o- Oscar Bistorius and stuff. Yeah. And then your T46 is your upper limb. Right. But then you can go uh, T45, which is double limb, or T47, which is just your wrist. Right. right. So it, it, it gets... Detailed. Yeah. yeah. And then that's just an amputee. Then you've got to think of like wheelchair and you've got to think of cerebral yeah. palsy. Yeah. But pretty much like intellectual disability is just this one category. Right. Yeah. In your T46 category, you ran in a final in Delhi. Yep. Did you, who, do you remember the guys that you competed with? Were they, what, what countries were they from? Yep. Um, you beat them. Uh, w- were they good blokes? Yeah. W- w- did, you, did you have, were you able to hold a conversation or was it a strict sort of competition and rivalry amongst these guys? Right. So um, in our para sport, it was kind of like they wanted to run the heat semis and finals all in the one day, which is not, you'll never see like a Usain Bolt or any of those yep. guys. So it was, a full day action packed you had to keep your adrenaline running kind of thing you didn't know who you competed well i didn't know who my competitor competitors was i wasn't doing any research but like the times was just it all varied you, yep. if you could run 11 3 then you were up there with the rest yep. but not the whole world just the commonwealth um countries and um i met all my competitors like literally in the warm-up room area where they're just doing the same thing that I'm doing. And um, I wouldn't be going up and go, hey, I'm Simon, I'm racing you today or anything <laughs> yeah, like yeah. that. It was just like, yeah, you're missing an arm. I'm mine. We're switched on. You're, you're one guy. Yep. Um, um, but in my warm-up runs and stuff like that, like dead set, I wasn't even looking at anyone except yep. for myself. Yep. You know, it was just like... I. I'm here to do perfection and that's what I'm going to do and uh, I've got to give 100% and no one in yeah, around me is concerning. In, individual sport. Yeah, you. individual you're, you're sport. Do, you're yeah. doing you. That's awesome. So, by the end of it, when I won it, yeah, I was like, hey, mate, what's your name yeah, kind of thing? Uh, you, you Can, gonna do you... So, we're flashing back to the six years ago, 2010 this was, is that still a moment crossing that line and that adrenaline dump and natural high is that still something you can remember like it's yesterday oh mate yeah like if i showed you the video now you would see just the joy like the that i ex- crossed the line and it was like 10 meters afterwards i realized that i actually won and like this uh, just that yeah <laughs> like, i could yeah. see the, like, could, the intensity of the emotion yeah. bryce he actually uh sent me a photo today um of you crossing the line at london was it yeah, London? No, that, that was the gold. That was the gold. That, that was, was the com games. That yeah. was the com yeah. games. But White uh, tip hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Yellow spikes. Sweet frosted tips. <laughs> yeah. But you've <laughs> got to fuck it. Type. But, but the intensity of the emotion that you can see in everybody finishing in that line, even the guys coming in fucking second and third, it's just fuck. It must be so intense in front of that many people. Like, it's like, you know, we, we watch the UFC every fucking weekend mm. and 
performing on a track and field like that in front of that many people would be s- similar fucking intensity. Oh, you know? def- a, a really explosive sport like that too, where it's just give it Sprinting, your all and there's yeah. that emotion afterwards. But um, describe the 48 hours after competing. Did you only run in the 100 at that meet? So was it 100 done and job done then? Yeah, exactly oh. that. Yeah. Did, you, did you go to sleep that night with your medal around your neck? Well, it was actually the day before I was really sick with like the flu. So it wasn't a thing that was going around the village, but because it was um, that country is, uh, it's the pollution's quite high, like we talked about. Yeah. It's kind of like that dust gets right up in your nose and like in you got a dry throat. But the worst thing is it's really hot, but you're sleeping in these small rooms that had air con blasting on 16 on a massive like yeah convert, like oh, a no. huge aircon and like you had no remote to be able to control it so it's you got sick really easy like your immune yeah. system the whole food situation like it so um when it was coming to the race i was like went straight to the doctor and he gave me like what i needed just to keep going and then on the day of the race i was all sweet <laughs> that yeah, sounds yeah. ominous as a he motherfucker. Gave, yeah. <laughs> he, he gave me some EPO. And, uh, of turned into a Went fucking. Saw the doctor <laughs> and uh, it was all good. It was all good. <laughs> well, and I got jacked as fuck. <laughs> Went and saw the doctor. He was operating out of a, the back alley of a slum. Like he wasn't in the village. <laughs> but you should have seen my quads. Fucking eight, eight <laughs> yeah. weeks later, bro. <laughs> I've never fucked harder. Like, ever. <laughs> But I can imagine, I can imagine that man, because I've been to like Southeast Asian countries where, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a beer, thanks, Paul. Um, where uh, the humidity is just like so foreign, and and you've got that mix of, oh, okay, we fix this by fucking blasting aircon, and you move from extremely fucking chilled room out into this sweat box heat that's just you have a shower and then the second that you walk outside you feel completely dirty again and and trying to perform a explosive fucking anaerobic athletic performance like that it must be um it must be pretty fucking hectic but i guess london was probably better was it cold when you were in london or? nah london was beautiful man. Awesome, like, yeah. whatever they did to the sky <laughs> that it worked it was unbelievable it was fucking mint like <laughs> 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 fucking toya or kluger yeah no it was um what do you reckon was like uh in terms of combination of all things together you know the uh the result of your performance the performance that you gave the combination of the experience of where you went and stuff like that if you had to pick an all-time one sort of highlight in athletics what do you think it would be uh yeah, like that's a tough question because yeah. <clears throat> like performance, you know, like you have your good days and bad days and I'd never like to pick my performances whatsoever, yeah. but experience, well, my mate and I went to um, the Taj Mahal and right. then that was an experience yeah. because the whole situation yeah. was all messed up. We couldn't get tickets or anything like that. So we kind of like... Do you need tickets to see the Taj Mahal? Well, in that sort of situation, yeah. Like, because there's like um, a train that leaves from... A bus that goes to the train station and then the train station goes all the way to Agra, which is like two and a half hours, three hours from where the village oh, was. Right, right. So you kind of had to like go through the whole process of like... Um, signing out of the village and then going into the actual country of India and then you know, really checking that out. But yeah, that whole experience. Oh, was wait. Me. So the fucking Olympic village is treated as a separate entity in terms of the nation state of the country that it's being held in? Nah. So it's not like they set up a new border. What, do you, what did you mean by you had to go into the actual country of India? Well, uh, I mean, you just had to leave the Olympic village. Yeah, I had to yeah. leave the village. So it was basically just... I thought there was like some, some way that they got around visas and shit like that. But everybody would still have to have proper visas and, and like immigration checks before they're allowed in, even if they're an athlete right yeah well like that's not the whole pre-departure thing man like six out six months out like ais one and apc one to give like they ask all your questions what's your passport number what's all this and they take care of that whole sort of situation yeah. and like you obviously get priority you're not just walking through a um, normal public queue you're actually walking into a country that have already organized your team to come yeah. in and do your whole process and vip like shit I'm 100%. still I'm still yet to uh, to have that treatment, but uh, hopefully one day. 
Fucking Danny's had I some mean, fucking if, horror if shows. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true. That's true. Loves, Immigration. Loves getting detained at LAX. Well, oh, damn. Yeah. LAX and I have, have a history to say the least. God yeah. damn, son. But um, yeah, hopefully if the podcast keeps going the way that it's going, we'll all be uh, traveling everywhere like that, you know? Definitely. We'll, <laughs> we'll be taking this thing <laughs> fucking roadshow. Like, probably do a bunch of live shows across the States. Early 2017. Like, Transition yeah. into a stand-up yeah. comedy career. For sure. Followed by the um, blockbuster Hollywood. If you're looking at the numbers on SoundCloud with the amount of views, <laughs> shit's about to get large. <laughs> son. Like, gonna make so much fucking money soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much Man. the sole purpose of this, folks. The knockoff is so we have to we we don't have to keep knocking off every every afternoon. You no, know? Ain't nothing but a cash grab and some entertainment, <laughs> baby. We just hustle. We just That's hustle. It. That's it. Embrace that struggle. So Simon, fast fo- <laughs> fast forward. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, enough, enough we got a job my, to do. Yeah, about my, enough about my struggles. Well, okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, back to me. So you go to um, flash forward it out of Delhi. You go there. Heading towards London as a as the Commonwealth Games champion, it, this time you enrol in both hundred and two hundred. Uh, got a got a bronze in the two hundred. I think you said earlier. Uh, just describe that for us. That must have been to be a <laughs> Wait, no, so no no disrespect to the Com Games. So which one did you blow your hammy in? Uh, the Paralympics. Yep. So and how did you get a bronze? Hung on, he fucking got it, got it out, son. Yeah. From home. Oh, fuck, man, yeah. I, th- I must be like playing back other fucking a- athletes dropping because I, mm. I had this mm. vision of you fucking dropping, but I did. I, I fell over the line. And that was it. I was on the floor. It was right holding. at the death, wasn't it? Yeah, like fuck, I was just man. on the ground holding my leg, and then I found out that I got the third of the bronze, and I was just fuck like, oh, woo, yeah. jumped up on the leg. I'm like, oh yeah, that's like, right. Oh <laughs> shit, what was the recovery like? Sorry to jump to a fucking new You're tangent, but. Yeah, no, like um, yeah. It was did you fu- did you blow it out bad or was it? Like uh, grade two. Grade two. Yeah, grade I don't two. Know what that means. Uh, so it's like um, a twelve centimeter lesion in the hamstring, like crossed down kind of oh, thing. Oh shit! So, so it's, it rips. Yeah. Vertically. Yeah. yeah, for me it does, but it doesn't go like across that way. Yeah, it pairs off like that. That's what I was saying before about your hammy like bowing in your own leg, as if it's like a rubber band coming together. Like yeah, you stretch yeah. it apart, then it'll go like a cramp. You mean? Meet, yeah, meet yeah. in the middle. That's that. Yeah, that's probably more. I've had a cramp, a, I've had a a cramp yeah, fucking surfing before and getting like oh, that when you sort of up. like laying on your front and you've got your. Fuck, that's a really hard thing to explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're laying parallel on a yeah parallel <laughs> on a surfboard and you're getting a fucking tight hamstring. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, and your feet are at right angles to your that's hamstrings, right. and then it, all of a sudden it's just like a fucking stapler and just crunches up. <laughs> Danny, <laughs> it's the stapler. <laughs> Rab- for, all you, for you fucking <laughs> South Park fans out there, so you get get to London, you compete in the 200 and get a bronze. That just must have been a fucking absolute trip. Yeah, well. Going back to your last question about like Commonwealth Games and then going to Paralympics, there is like a massive difference, um, Commonwealth versus the oh, rest of the world. Everyone's there. That's it. Yeah. You, uh, before I was saying, yeah, no disrespect to the Com Games. Yeah. But it's Commonwealth countries only for the non sort of sports fans out there. It's, if you're in the Commonwealth under the Queen, you compete there. Then we go to the big show and we got the US there, the fucking rest of them, Jamaica, yeah. all, all the rest yeah. of them. They're there throwing down, so yeah. So the the medal there, the bronze on that absolute world stage, is fucking just as valuable for mine. If I'm an outsider looking in, that's a fucking achievement and a half, mate. Mate, well, my so on the Commonwealth level, like that was my first introduction to international competition, and then that was in 2010, and then in 2011 I went to World Championships, and that was. The first time the rest of the world, it was against me. That So that was where I was needed to put my like foot down and go, you know, I'm Simon Patmore yeah. and had that complete attitude because it was such a sport that you, if you didn't have that sort of personality, some person might have it over you. Mm. Oh, you look at how flamboyant the... If you're looking at the 100 meter final at any sort of Blue Ribbon Olympic Games, Usain and all the personalities, all these guys out there... They're all supremely confident in their own ability and it you can see it. It just rubs off in their personality and well, charisma. It's exactly the same in the paradigm. Oh, absolutely. Man. Like it's, th- it's that blue ribbon thing where it's, I'm turning up here and I'm the best at something. 
Yeah, and, and is it it's a psych out sort of thing as well? If you're, if you're, in, the, if you're in the marshalling oh. area, mental warfare, hundred yeah. percent. So in the um, final of the Commonwealth Games, I was literally sitting in the um, room, which is five minutes before you go out onto the track, the marshalling area. Yeah, actually. where they check your that's spikes an, that's a and stuff area, like that. Right. Oh, hundred percent. You've done your warm up. You've done everything. Now you're walking in a room with your your other competitors, and you have to you you can tell the ones that crumble can't handle that sort of pressure and then you can tell the ones that can hold yeah, it i'm, I'm here I ain't i'm on fucking yeah. you right now yeah, yeah. oh 100 percent. and that that can win it or lose it for you mm. and you haven't even run the race that's it yeah your race is over before it began there's t- plenty of sports where that can happen was mm. there any kind of um was there any kind of sports psychology like coaches or anything like that in in ais did you guys ever have any oh, that 100 percent. like they've got you know the best of the best facilities yeah but and not might like be like the best of the best or a person that works with you. So psychology is such a personal thing. Like, yeah. you, you know, the AIS will say it's available to you, but you might not get along with the person that is there. So it's yeah. kind of like you go out and do your own thing if you need it. Mm. Um, I am a very strong believer in it. Like I, it only helps you up to a degree, you know, like, a sports psych is a person that will help you develop a technique that will stop you getting nervous before a race because he's taught you something that you might go, okay, I need to settle my nerves. I know I get nervous before going in the blocks. Let me do these sort of techniques and then, okay, I'm sweet. And that's an interesting thing too because you've said they can only do so much and that's so fucking true because they can't go out and compete for you. They can mind no. coach you up as much as possible to get you through routine and things like that but... At the end of the day, it's on you. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And if you're not open to it, then like you're losing out. Mm-hmm. You know, like whatever it is. How was uh, village life in say London compared to a place like Delhi in terms of the facilities <laughs> that they had? To you a bit more comfort in living. Oh, uh, oh, mate, London was just <laughs> like they I had to see the g- smile on your face. <laughs> mate, it's like London, that- baby, we fucking <laughs> made it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like dead set, they had a recording studio like. A proper recording studio where you could just do whatever you want to do. A podcast in there, wow. like like, and they had a professional. So something yeah, knock not off. quite as good as the Julie Street Studios yeah. is, <laughs> is what I'm getting from you. Knock off podcast live from Tokyo 2020, ladies and gents. We're here, episode 685. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're famous as shit now. <laughs> uh, oh, outrageous. Yeah. But yeah, so the village was fucking grouse yeah well london unbelievable man like <clears throat> it just the whole setup and like volunteer situation as well like yep. you cannot get lost and there's so much to do um and it's just like a good valley did you spot any uh any high profile athletes and shit like that um so probably the most high profile person i've met is um prince charles Oh, and for that real. And that was at the yeah, Commonwealth Games. Went big straight yeah. off the bat. Holy oh, fuck. Oh, dude, I was training and then I looked at, my, looked at my coach and I was just like, that's Prince Charles. See you later, mate. Yeah, <laughs> holy just fuck. stopped training. You called straight. him mate? Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, for sure. Nice, nice. Yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. Well, bring him, bring I, him down a peg, man. Yeah. He eats and shits just like you do, you oh, know? Yeah. Well, 100%, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The biggest thing is that... We are I part of the monarchy, but let's face it, yeah, peeps, in uh, 2016, yeah. nobody's really... Uh, That's it, man. Get the fuck out of my way, old man. <laughs> 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 You're standing in front of the, fi- yeah. in front of the fish buffet, yeah, dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Either get your Vegemite scroll and piss off or fucking get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have Vegemite scrolls in the village? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was, um, what was he competing in? <laughs> <laughs> he was doing the high jump Prince uh, Charles Holy shit oh, You mentioned his name before But during your Any of your campaigns Say world championships Or whatever Have you ever met Oscar P- Pistorius yeah, yeah yeah I raced against him In the holy 2011 uh, World championships Boy, in, the, wow, in, in, wee, in the relay man. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. In the relay In the relay And I um, met Usain Bolt In 2011 As well In Europe uh, I would have dropped his name Over Charles Fucking any day of the week <laughs> Man <laughs> to Royalty me, to, me, to me man <laughs> Oh, yeah, but see, this is what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, right? as, as Danny said, but on, on, on paper, fucking Prince Charles is the more notable oh, person. But really but ask it. ask any yeah. fucking red blooded person on on planet Earth yeah. at the moment. Do you want to hang out with fucking Usain for the night? Oh yeah. Well, I shouldn't say re- red blooded. I mean, there's probably a lot of people over the age of 
60, yeah. 70. Yeah. Even, f- come on, my dad would choose to fucking have a few beers with Usain over oh, Prince Charles fuck any fuck fucking night of the man. week. Because he knows what <laughs> fucking fluff Usain's bringing with him. <laughs> 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 Although, hey, don't sleep on it. Prince Charles could pull fluff if he wanted to. <laughs> if he wanted to be and was like able, Bill able Clinton to get, spec yeah, savage. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Bill Clinton, fucking shout out Bill. to that guy. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. If you're listening, Bill, you're the fucking man. Yeah. We'll we'll uh we'll target Bill one of these days, get him on, pick his brain over uh He couldn't have anything better to do. His terms in office. Yeah. Yeah, he couldn't have anything better. No, I mean do, Julia Street Studios, bro. Shout out, baby. <laughs> <laughs> if you've so you've gone Com games into Olympic games and competed, you've was there temptation to try for another Rio campaign or was it becoming father time catching up slash I've been there done that I don't want this as much yeah so over the eight years like you develop as an athlete um and then you just you kind of find your ways and figure out like you know do I want to want to do another four years which is totally possible but then your mind picks up on you and you just like oh that's um not what I really want to do anymore. Four years too. It's a that's a long time, man. It's a it's a full dedication, and like you know, you've already had one taste of it, so you know what it's gonna take. But like you're going into your later twenties, and like things start to change. Yeah. Like because you di- you would have been twenty eight competing at Rio, or are you twenty nine now? Nah, twenty nine. Twenty nine. Twenty yeah. nine. Yeah. So in terms of an athletic career as well, that's <coughs> that is late, isn't it? Yeah. For, yeah. for that for that dedication for. A sport like that, although Usain is thirty, thirty, but yeah. um, he's fucking the fastest man ever. So well, he, he did his performance when he was twenty five, twenty four, twenty five. That's so, true. That's you know, true. Like he's just maintained from there, right. but hasn't gone quicker. Right. That's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. Dude's a fucking savage. Mm. Eh? I love that guy. Man. There was um, <clears throat> actually a funny story about uh, Simon and I. We um, we used to work both at this same hospital, and uh, every year they would have like a charity um, fundraiser where you would. It was called Race to the Roof, basically, and you'd run up this internal internal staircase that was about like ten or ten ten flights of More, stairs or something man, like that. Yeah, it's huge. That's and only then, five and then onto building. the helipad. Yeah, yeah. So it was like uh, a flight, as in fucking. You've got a, a spiral exactly. staircase yeah. heading up, How and then is this and then you get thing? onto the roof. It's like it's. It's big enough spacey, to like get around yeah. people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah that's and then and then you get up onto a roof and then you have to like run up another set of stairs to get onto the helipad where the fucking uh ambulance helicopter will land for the hospital and shit like that. And so um as you can imagine, it's a whole lot of, you know, general people, fucking people in their middle ages, like not not necessarily athletic, running it or whatever. But there's a sense of competition around it because all of these uh doctors and shit like that will um you know, have the bragging rights to who's got the record for the for the fastest run to the roof and stuff like that. And there were um, rumors. I remember when we when we first decided to do it, that there was a cardiovascular surgeon that had run it in some crazy time and set the record. And apparently, he used to to do it to break up his like twenty four hour surgeries and stuff like that, where he'd be just working literally for a day around the clock, and so he'd just go fucking sprint the stairs. But um, so much fucking money. I started I started G and Simon up and I was like, bro, I reckon you fucking got this, man. Like, think about it. Like and we got there and we started sort of doing a few stretches down in the lobby and we're looking around and it's like there's nobody there. There's no no competition. I'm like, you got this dog. We're fucking we're in the money here. Like and uh, I can't remember what it was that you won. Like yeah, that was, was my next question. <laughs> I was like, so what do you win for this thing? Like, it so was for charity, so yeah, whatever yeah. you want goes to the charity, but the bragging rights. But um so we're warming up and then all of a sudden there's this guy who's fucking Usain 2.0, bro. Oh, no. And uh, long and lean. White? And a white Usain? He was black. Oh. <laughs> had gloves on, but. Like, and uh, so there's a name on the roster that's like a really African name. Like, you know, like I'll, I'd be totally making something up, yeah. but like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to do it because it's going to sound, <laughs> it's gonna yeah. sound fucking yeah. like I'm a bigot. But... Um, and anyway, this dude is like wearing full fucking gloves so that he can <laughs> so that he can properly grab the railing on the inside. And he's doing these big high knee warm ups down this one hallway and shit. This guy's like six three, man, and, and oh built exactly God. like you saying. And and Simon and I both just kind of looked at each other. 
He would have had a piece on it. Yeah, he would have. A surgeon on that much cash with a piece. And oh. uh, and I was like, shit, son. I think uh, this Ugandan bloke might have your number, right? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and and turns out he did. He fucking. Well, he got silver. Um, and then the um surgeon got the record. Really? Yeah. I thought the fucking. I thought the African Usain. bloke won. No, nah, nah, if he was Usain, he was a sprinter. <laughs> the, the Kenyan came yeah, on man. and finished the over dead the top set, of man. Him. I fucking. I had done leg day that week. <laughs> <laughs> maybe even That's the fucking <laughs> maybe even the day before, <laughs> and uh, and it got to about the third flight of stairs, and my legs just stopped working, man. Like the <laughs> lac- lactic acid just got to the point where it was like the intent was there to lift my leg, but it was just <clears throat> oh no. <laughs> and I uh, and I basically dragged myself up the last sort of three flights of stairs. Didn't didn't. Realize with, the, with you know, no gloves. Speaking with no gloves, man. <laughs> but I had the gloves. <laughs> the calluses have only just subsided. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like talking, like how we were talking before. If you were to go out now and do full effort out on a fucking track in a set of running spikes, you don't actually realize how much you've lost since you used to like dabble in that shit as a fucking teenager or whatever. But and and the, like I said, the intent is there. I get to the third flight of stairs, and I'm all fucking, I'm all adrenaline, baby. Like, and then and then all of a sudden, I'm dragging myself across that line, and it took me a good two hours, maybe maybe even more, maybe like half a day to properly come good and get my appetite back. Like, got to the point where it was like spew worthy. And that's when I when I hear you talking about the two hundred, and I think about the four and the eight and oh, shit like yeah. that. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> the yuck. acid in your legs is just oh, horrendous yeah. so we're looking at so no aspirations to go to rio but listeners it's looking like simon is about to undertake a qualifications process to become a winter olympian so for all people who aren't up to date with those sort of sports uh simon is looking to enroll in to becoming a winter Athlete in the snowboard cross, which is essentially fucking BMX on a snowboard. If I'm just describing it as simple as I possibly yeah. can, it's BMX on a snowboard. So yeah, if you watch the Olympics, it's exactly mm. like that. It's motocross if you like motorbikes. Ex- yeah, and ex- stuff. exactly. That that's a fucking good one too. But and uh, how many fucking athletes are out there that have made the switch from <laughs> summer to winter? Is that like like you were saying something originally that um, Australia had? like a very small team so they were like they saw potential in your sort of measurements and abilities and shit that they were like this motherfucker we can train up to to have a team in this fucking snowboard cross event if you end up being on across two disciplines like that if you're not the only one who's ever done that you're on a fucking short list of australians that have man are you aware of any that have um not male, definitely female. Yeah. We've we've got um, one at the moment, Jess Gallagher, and it, hands down, she's you know pushed past the point where she's been competing for the last ten years of her life. So, you know, she's given it a crack. So, but what, she, what, so has she done a she, athletics and has come across. Well, to she started off in skiing, so oh, she was she's in. She's gone the other way. Yeah, nice. she went, Shout out Jess Gallagher. Yeah, Fuck Jess him. Gallagher. Yeah, um, she went from uh gs uh so skiing down a hill as fast as possible and then giant slalom for giant all those fucking casual fans out there <laughs> <laughs> that was in uh, Which I ain't one of them <laughs> i was in uh vancouver 2010 oh, yeah. Yeah, no shit. yeah yeah uh she got a bronze there and then uh she moved over to athletics and did javelin and long jump as well javelin. Fuck, two yeah unique yeah. events there yeah too. yeah awesome. it is it's you can vary yeah heptathlete yeah, if yeah she, that's like it a woman yeah and then um she's an aussie She's an Aussie, yeah, yeah. And then she went back to skiing for Sochi and uh, she got another bronze. Fuck um, oh, dude. Man. Jess is a savage. Yeah. If you're Mate, listening, well, Jess, listen come to on this. the fucking yeah, podcast. Just, well, listen to this. Games groupie. Like, just <laughs> loves going to different games. That's fucking yeah, awesome. Yeah, she's good, man. She's good. Fuck and then she, mode. now she's going to Rio Jesus. for cycling. Oh, has been to Rio. No, well, no, Paralympics. So oh. it's about to start in eight oh. days' time. Holy shit. Yeah, so so cycling is the next thing. And uh, like that's vel- incredible. Velodrome, velodrome yeah. Fuck. Talk about big quads. Holy fuck. But that's the biggest... and Well, her disability, man. Mm. That is the key thing because she's easily doing like 80, 90, 100 Ks possibly on skis and she's a blinky. Like she's blind. Like dead set. 
can't see where she's going. For a she, second there, I thought you said she was blind and skiing at 90 yeah, miles an hour. No, dead set. Like, she has a um, person who rides in front of her. Who's an elite as fuck as well. Yeah, yeah. and he's telling her to you know, go from one edge to the other. Shout and she, out. She, she's fuck. bombing down the hill. Jess like, Gallagher, fucking shout out. Hand on heart. That's a good Aussie. What a savage. Yeah, dead set, man. Like, it's, it's great to see, like, that side of things. And if... I look at my career and go, yeah, I've got this far. I look at Jess Gallagher and I go, I want to be like you. Yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. Like, there's that, that potential. Yeah, there. yeah. Well, Shit, I look yeah. at her and I'm just like, yeah, man. Like but for Simon's always been good at board sports as long as we've known him. Any sort of skateboarding, anything is it's sort of become a natural thing. Have you? Is this something you have approached the AIS yourself and shown initiative to try and compete at a winter format, or have they hollered at you saying, "Hey, there might be something here"? So, like, what happened was is that um, when I quit running, I didn't want to do it anymore. I literally ticked off all the goals that I wanted to do in it, and one of the goals was to go to Brazil, to Rio. But I didn't make it to the games. I was able to do a trip with the Australian team just to do the pre-games and check it out. So I got over there and checked it all out, the villages and the um, uh, stadiums that were half done at the time. But um, basically, I then turned around and was like, yeah, that's it. I want to go on to snowboarding. And then um, what happened was is that I quit. Two days later, I got a phone call from the Australian Paralympic Committee um and they just turned around and said do you want to give snowboarding a go and i was like well <laughs> that was the funny bit because i was turning around and i was like yeah i'll give it a go for sure and they're like have you snowboarded before and i was like yeah i went <laughs> i went to japan <laughs> i went to hakaba and they're like oh yeah hakaba is good yeah you went to hapo one yeah i went to hapo one and that conversation was over but like when i went there the snow hadn't fallen at the time so it was, I su- it was a summer holiday in japan <laughs> I'd seen, I'd seen the slopes where they would potentially be. But, uh, so they turned around and yeah, said... Yeah, I went to Hakuba. <laughs> yeah. They turned around and said like, oh, all right, we'll come down to Parashar and um, you'll give it a crack. And I'm like, yeah, sweet. So um, I called up my mate Doddy. <laughs> like, shit, man, yeah. was it summer in Hakuba? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I was eating Threadbow during the landslide. But I, <laughs> I, gave, um, I gave my mate Doddy a call and I was like, oh, you mean... You wouldn't have snow boots. Can I borrow your snowboard? <laughs> 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 what size boot are you, bro? Yeah, exactly, man. That's what it went down as. He's like, yeah, come over, man. So I picked up his board and his boots and like um, I borrowed your gear as well. Danny, I got your stuff from uh, right. Whistler. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which I actually from got from the Lost and Found from my yeah. mate who worked in the bar. He stole it. Yeah. Yeah. Stole <laughs> <laughs> he had the best hookup, man. We knew, we knew a bartender on... Uh, over in Canada, and any time you needed any shit, man, you just walk in, be like, man, I need some sunnies. Be like, yeah, lost and found, bin, baby. Fucking get there. <laughs> drunk, drunk people like leaving their snowboards behind, ski goggles, and then he'd fucking oh, have the hookup. And man. then flying so, back to Omaha or wherever yeah. the fuck, you know, <laughs> like they're not coming back no, for that shit. God, no, man. No. Fuck it. <laughs> Doing them a favor. I used to brag that I had gotten my entire snowboard set up for 80 bucks. Oh, that's good. So I got uh, boots and board off this guy for 60 bucks. He's Brazilian. <laughs> like a shout out. Yeah. <laughs> My buddy actually came along with me and uh, we ended up just um, doing a real good haggle job on this guy. Eh? Basically, he was leaving, I, mate. Took, I took my mate along as if he was the expert. And then I showed some interest in the board and boots initially. And then my mate was like, nah, we're leaving, mate. No, thanks. And then the guy was just like distraught so i just ended up giving to me for 60 bucks and uh and then went to like the op shop to get some jacket that was totally inappropriate for the snow but (laughs) the spray jacket down there on hastings like just (laughs) (laughs) it's like man it's gonna be chilly out there you sure you 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 want that queensland winter spray jacket those those woolen sleeves are gonna get awfully wet up there dude (laughs) (laughs) oh man the shit you learn along the way motherfucker (laughs) so you they contact you. Yeah. At, at what point do you admit to them that you haven't been to Hakuba, Japan on a snowboarding trip? Just or, then. Yeah, <laughs> bang. Yeah. Do you have... um? So they say, hey, look, fucking winter is coming. Shout out to all you Game of Thrones fans <laughs> out there. W- winter is coming. Come down to Hotham or Perisher, like one of the Australian resorts for all the international listeners. 
Uh, do, do you go down there for somewhat of a trial run first? Yeah, or? so that's exactly what it was. Um, they do talent camps or yeah. future camps. Do they? And sh- surely they couldn't just put you into a board across uh, course straight up, or do they teach you nah, heel man. side, toe side, like, heel side, toe if side? If you've got a decent coach, you've got to know an athlete what they're capable of doing. Yeah, and if, like, you know, if they throw you down a course or a blue run on your first hit. <laughs> yeah. <That's it>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I guess the big difference is that, um, you know, you would have had some level of confidence coming from the skateboard background that you've that you've had you know i think you know if you were a complete newbie like you'd never participated in board sports before at all you'd never even fucking stood on something with wheels that was basically what i was fucking the closest yeah. thing yeah. i came to it it was called the flow board and it's like a skateboard but hooks over your feet and then has like a bit of a trolley wheel on each of the um, trucks. Really? Yeah. So, so it's you, just like you 360 can slide degrees? Out. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can do Sounds like... dangerous sli- as a motherfucker. <laughs> oh, it's on bitumen, man. And you need <laughs> oh, speed to be able to man. do it. So that's a funny thing you fucking mentioned bitumen. I was, I was over there in Canada snowboarding fucking multiple times a week having a great old time. I'm like, man, I'm going to start skating when I get back to I can fucking skate now. <laughs> Didn't pick up a board once. <laughs> Not once, man. I'm like, that shit is hard. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm, I don't want it that bad. Well, it's just that it's, as you say, it's totally the difference between water, between snow, and yeah. between fucking concrete. Yeah, it's going to rip my so elbow to yeah. shreds if I fuck up. You fall up. off a surfboard, yeah. you kook, kook a couple of waves. It's like, oh, shit, man, I've got to get my got to get my skill back up. But exactly. uh, you eat shit on the concrete a couple of times, and it's like, fuck, I might need to uh, rehab for the next four weeks. Well, you learn <laughs> your lesson really quickly. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's true, too. That's, that's true. true. Yeah. And you learn how to fall as well in that yeah. sport. Yeah, so 100%. Yeah. You go down to a training camp. Is it something where a coach saw you first up and went, oh, fuck, you've, you've ridden some sort of board before we got something here to work with? Uh, well, you hit the nail on the head there. It's the way you fall. So it's like I didn't know how to snowboard they could tell straight away that I hadn't snowboarded because I couldn't link my turns. Mm. But the way I fell was a safe way to be able to know that I can get back up again. So on a snowboard, if you're going down on ice and you fall in the most awkward position, you're down for good, man. Like, you know, you'll be hurting yourself. Because the snowboard cross is pretty fucking icy. It's not like pow pow, is it? No, no, no yeah. pow. It's is compacted it p- snow. Properly groomed hard, or is it sort well, of not, not even groomed? Yeah. Well, they do groom it because you do get a lot of ruts in the um, berms from edges and shit. Well, yeah, yeah. and on snowboards. Yeah, uh, yeah you definitely would have caught an edge with those fucking shitty goggles you got from me, Ooh, son. <laughs> <but that's laughs> Mate, they didn't saved me more fucking, time. He, did, <laughs> he didn't give you those white ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Damn. you would have gone you on just be cruising along. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you were wearing those on a bluebird day, though, yeah, man. That's was. not good. Oh, <laughs> shit, son. That would have been burning your eyes yeah. completely. Like, man, what, this guy's who, wearing an Who AIS? said that? Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's got an AIS jacket. And look at his fucking goggles. Right. <laughs> 100%. Fuck it. 100%. So, someone used them at fucking Nagano 02, <laughs> like, handed them in down at Vancouver at the used fucking centre. No, nah, bro. Like, they were spy, bro. Spy, <laughs> man. Yeah, they, oh, were they, they really? Could, yeah, they were Fuck, good. man. Early spy, dog. Like, they come a long way. Oh, the lenses were just absolutely destroyed. That's spy.com slash knockoff for 10% off any and all goggles. <laughs> nah. Fuck. Anyway, your goggles were fucking ranked down there. And, 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 so they take you. Yeah, they, they <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. There's nothing wrong with them, mate. No, they did it. the job. You can right? still see. Thank you yeah. very much. Well, you're dead right. Well, look where you are now. You progress. <laughs> you progress through first training camp. They can see that you have something. Did they put you through a snowboard cross first before you went to competitive meets for snowboard cross? Um. Yeah, so what happened was is that the three-day camp was basically... Simon's like just showing us the f- <laughs> 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 selfie of him repping the spies, oh the my white God. spies. <laughs> that was at Whist as well. It's that a fucking sick. good powder that you got. Oh, yeah. you took him back to Whistler. Yeah. yeah That's man. awesome. It's like uh, shout out Teddy in a box. <laughs> it's funny though. Simon, Simon's in the photo that he's showing us at present. He has... Uh, Jess is in the photo uh, and another friend of his... And they're both wearing their goggles where Simon has his off because he can't see <laughs> shit. I've been in enough fucking snow to know that they've kept their goggles on because they can see, and Simon's like, just keep fogging up like a motherfucker. Shout out, Benny. Yeah. Thanks thanks for giving me the, the, the fucking... For everybody yeah. who's listened to uh, episode three, that was uh, <laughs> yeah. thanks to Benny. Yeah, that's another thing that he fucking <laughs> got himself into. 
<laughs> I'm mad, man. So fucking good. We'll have to get him on again soon, actually. He was a fucking... He did well. Um, you go compete at your first meet. You yeah. Just... So how it worked is that I had like three days um, on snow. So the first day was just showing what I've got, how to link turns. The second day was straight on a border cross track. But it was um, very slushy at the time, so it was. A so where were you when this happened? Perisher. Perisher. Yeah, and uh, is, that's in Victoria for all the. No, no, that's New South Wales. Is it really? Yeah, right. it's two hours out from Canberra. Right. Actually, yeah. Right. Um, Shout out Canberra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then um, on the third day, I was able to do the full course when it was actually firm, and then basically they turned around and it's like, all right. You've got the potential. Same sort of conversation I had when, it, when I was 17 years age and then um, was at the AIS and they were like, you can go to the Com Games. Same sort of conversation. They're like, you've got it. You've just got to commit to it. You've got history of your athletics. So they're like, we will commit if you commit um, and we'll see where this goes. So the commitment is the financial part of it. So they sent me over to Netherlands to get my international classification to say that i am disabled enough to be able to verse someone with a missing arm um i had to do my first international competition there and absolutely sucked yeah different different game when you um go down a slope without looking at certain objects that you have to turn but when you've got like a gate in front of you and you have to make a certain turn at a certain time and you've got a bunch of people jostling for position and shit a bunch of people who grew up in europe well, yeah, hundred <laughs> like percent. At this shit yeah. since they were fucking yeah. in. At, Aussie, 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 Aussie. at that <laughs> stage, yeah. <laughs> Fifty-two degree summer. <laughs> yeah, fucking, you're dead right, man. You're talking about some of these like ski rats from over there that would have been fucking knee deep in power. Yeah, I had since they uh, were young. I came tenth in that competition, but it was a time trial competition, so it wasn't individual. Board, yeah, it was right. individual at that stage. So, border cross has just come on board with the. Uh, international paralympic committee and there's two events in the next games which is going to be bank slalom which is a time trial around flags zigzagging down um and then you've got your two on two um border cross so fuck yeah Yeah. and so what's like um what's i guess for you if if you know delhi and london were kind of you know the I, I, I suppose the pinnacle of the athletic career. What what in your mind is your you know what's your London of uh, of snowboarding? What are you what are you hoping to um, to aim for in in the winter stuff? <laughs> Look, it's like it's so early, and that's the whole thing about Paralympic sport is that um, you're forever looking for athletes with a disability to bring in, and in amputee level, it's a high volume of athletes that yeah, come in. Yeah. So you could be a pro snowboarder and then lose your hand to miniature cockle, yeah, and true. then next thing you could be in the competition. So for me, I, oh man, like I am dreaming and sweating about getting a medal. Like that's yeah. that's what I want. That's that's the ultimate thing. But it's the winter and para, uh, winter and summer. Paralympic label under yeah. my belt. That's that's what's more important nice. to me. And so D- dual international spec. It's like representing the Kangaroos in rugby league and then going to the play for the Wallabies. And it's, it's the same same equivalent. Love that for stuff. that athletic individuals. And it's happening more and more, not just in able bodies, but also in D- AWD athletes yeah. with a disability. So yeah, it's it's interesting, and, and I really um, it shows you the top. Um, athleticism that you can possibly be whether it's you put me in cricket you put me in um, snowboarding or soccer I'll show you I can do all range of sports at a high level fuck yeah man natural athletics you're able to transition to other sports so the so the and so, is it 2018 South Korea? Is that where we're going? That, for? Yeah, yeah, Pyeongchang. Pyeongchang, yeah. 2018. 2018. So, yeah, a year and a half out right now. For, I think it was 521 days now, or something like that. Fuck yeah, bro. That's uh, they that's fin- a, they finally got one. CM Punk is fucking doing basically two years worth of training and competing in his first ever <laughs> fucking MMA fight. So if you can pick up a snowboard even fucking longer time than that, then. Is Watch the fuck out, South Korea. <laughs> CM Punk, I'm like, we C- coming. Like, is CM Punk going to your Pyeongchang? <laughs> <laughs> CM Punk's a fucking gun snowboarder. He's, uh, yeah. yeah. Look, he, he's won me over with those documentaries. Fucking anyway. CM Punk, for a, 
fans out there that don't follow combat sports, he's a WWE superstar who's about to make his professional mixed martial arts debut at UFC 203. Having never fought before as a 36-year-old, 37-year-old, yep. he's um he's definitely uh to the latter stages of what you would call a typical fucking MMA career age. Sporting career at that. Like Simon Correct. mentioned before, it became the ambition to go to Rio. He had to weigh it up being 29 years old at the time of competing. This guy is coming into a fucking ass-kicking competition at 37 years oh, old. Right. Hand-to-hand I mean, hand combat, I, somebody's I, I, trying to end uh, the other person. That's right. I take, I take my hat off to the guy, and I've, I respect what he's doing, and he has really won me over with his personality. In the There's a YouTube documentary series on him now called The Evolution of Punk, if you're out there and, and want something to listen. It's basically like you or I just go off the street walking into an elite-level martial arts gym and saying, train me up. Yeah, I think the thing that I took from, I've watched the first two episodes as well, as well at your advice, and I think the thing that I took was um, he says something at one stage about, you know, he may not have the experience, he may not necessarily have the credentials, but he is a fucking consummate professional when it comes to training and find find a guy who's going to dedicate themselves full time to it and work that fucking hard every day and it's like... I mean, I respect that, but having having watched the documentary of the footage that they're showing in 2015 of him first drilling, I'm like, yeah, this guy has never fought in his life before. Jeez. And I think when I watch it, the feeling that I get, and uh, and this is totally all due respect to fucking CM Punk, utmost respect, and I, I, I'm a fan too, I, I'm cheering for him, but um, I see it as maybe more of a... <clears throat> A chance for the UFC to make money off some promotional stuff, i.e., this this uh, ep- episode series that he's doing, and uh, and potentially just just the one off fight against somebody who's got a low record. And I just I don't know. I guess you get spoiled for choice when you see these guys in their fucking open workouts and and training videos and stuff, and you just you don't really appreciate just how high level they are until you see somebody who's a total newbie come in and try to try to drill strikes and you it just right. i mean he's he is coming in cm is coming in to compete against uh ufc 170 pounder mickey gall and mickey gall is a brown belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu meaning he's had the best part of eight to ten years on the mat on the mat yeah. he's a he's a legitimate Fucking brown snake credentialed brown belt won his ufc debut in very, very quick fashion by a rear naked choke over a guy called Michael Jackson. Not that Michael Jackson, <laughs> uh, an other Michael Jackson. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> shout out Thanks for clearing that up. Sh- yeah. Yeah, shout, out to the late, <laughs> shout out to the late great Michael, the fucking one, the only. I wonder if they'll, um, if they'll ever transition into, into para martial arts, do you think? Uh, they got judo now. Judo. Yeah, right. yeah, judo. As part of the Olympics. Yeah, uh, Paralympics, yeah yeah, 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 definitely. So... Wow. Um, I think it's for uh, the blind as well, so it's not just amputee. Um, That's wow. interesting as well because that judo. Never fucking done judo. But I've, seen, <laughs> I've seen it. I've, I've seen it. So ladies you know, and gentlemen, back we preface yeah, everything yeah. with backyard philosophy, armchair opinion, quarterback. <laughs> 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 so it seems to be like a jujitsu spec martial art where if you got a high level. I'll use Ronda as an example. Ronda's the jiu-jitsu pract- uh, judo practitioner that's translated across to mixed martial arts. If you were to get Ronda in a gi against another opponent and blindfolded her, she would be able to do a hell of a lot on feel, I think. 100%. Man, like, what is it? Muscle memory and all that sort of yeah, stuff. It's just like right. you lose your awareness, you lose your sense and stuff like that. And yeah, that would definitely take a while to develop your ability um, to lose that sort of feeling and that's what the whole Paralympic scene is about it's not a disability but it's the ability to do your sport yeah, that's yeah. and that's, that's a, a crazy a it's it. a crazy thing about the way that the the human brain works like uh, I um I started learning guitar when I was about 10 years old and I remember my guitar teacher at the time was telling me that you know these shapes that you're making with your fingers and stuff like that you just need to make them enough times and drill this one progression over and over until the neurological pathways in your brain to do that motor skill are you know strengthened enough to the point where it just becomes something that you don't 
even have to think about and it just happens and then all of a sudden you know you you slash playing guitar on fire behind your head because you it's just you, it, you it. you're in flow you know what i mean and um and i read this interesting article on the conversation i always talk about the conversation on this podcast but um it was about athletes and like uh their sort of psychological performance and how a lot of athletes will describe their their performance in terms of when they're in flow and when they're in flow and when they're at the performing at the utmost peak of their ability it's when they're not actually connected to what they're doing at all it's almost that they're on autopilot and they're just completely in the moment to the point where they don't have to think about what the next move is they're just they're just moving through it and and how athletes like you're saying in the marshalling area can get psyched out because they're they're not experiencing that flow they're like you know just some sort of little vibration off the mark where it's it's when when you're talking about like you know going back to your athletic days and we're talking about you know you're saying oh fuck that was such a slow time it was 10 6 instead of 10 2 and shit like that and it's like when you're talking about these tiny fucking increments of of a measurement of who who wins the performance and it's like that mental game is is such the big part of it eh? it's fucking wild to think about but um mental coaching in itself is fucking insane it's like we were saying before it's preparing someone to go through a process mm. and do you is there is there that option available for winter olympic athletes is there is there much mental coaching that you could do for a sport like border cross or is it just it's a fucking high-paced, high-adrenaline sport where... It's competition in general, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Competition in general, but this one is a almost... Yeah, I, I suppose there is in terms of preparation, but things happen so quickly in this sport. And there's got to be some strategy involved in it, no? And this is where it comes down to who's your coach mm. because the coach is the person that you look to and get all your answers from, whether it's a mental thing, physical thing, or yep. just a... a a thing that might be happening at home, yep. you know, like advice, whatever. But a coach, a really d- good coach can take you from one level and then take you to another level. And that is the difference and that's the maturity of the sport because when you first start off, you don't know what a coach actually means. And then when you're like eight years deep, mm. you know, you see the value in them. Like, hang on, this guy's been here fucking the whole time. Yeah. And and that's the thing, man, like they're completely underpaid, get nothing from like the government or whatever, you know, they're on a wage, but like when knowledge is passed from one person to another, it becomes, you know, valuable. That's right. But no no money could really put it on there, but an athlete could really understand like, you know, like You bet you bet your ass in terms of satisfaction when you cross the line in Delhi and end up standing up on that podium with a gold medal around your neck. The coach is their proudest mm. punch, and it's all worth it. Yeah, it's such a it's such an interesting sort of um, play of of personalities, or like you're saying, knowledge. I guess like how you've got this incredibly able-bodied young person who's just you know at the peak of their athletic ability. You know, fucking you you like we we're saying, your athletic prime decreases through your thirties and stuff like that but you don't quite have the same, I guess, mental insight that, you know, you're potentially more older or more mature, I should say, coach um, has. And then you get that combination of, okay, I've got the body, but I've got the fucking, I've got the game plan or I've got the experience Mm -hmm. or, you know, the knowledge in regards to this and it it is a team, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, set up. Is there... Is there touching on strategy with border cross is there instructions you'll receive from a coach beforehand saying hey tra- trail this guy through turn five because he's been fucking up there because they're obviously watching the other events with you too do they do yeah, they give you advice this yeah, guy's yeah. achilles with this switch <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i'll take a crowbar to this dude's knee in the car park because yeah. he's fucking gonna get the gold that's medal. my strategy <laughs> <Yeah. Ball. laughs> yeah, yeah. no 100 percent. yeah 100 percent on it it's kind of like <clears throat> for in the sport, we're very lucky because we only versus um, one other competitor in Border Cross. So it's kind of like, you know that character, you know if he can pull out of the start gate really quickly. Oh, really? I really, thought really it was slow. multiple people. No, it's two and two. So it's like, <laughs> you could say it's one on one, but it's two and two. So it's um, I'm racing one other competitor to, to the final. Um, in 
X Games, it's six on six. Okay, yeah. that's what I'm thinking Which of. Which is yeah. fucking insane. So that's in the para sports, and then you go able body, and then it's eight on eight. So Holy it, it, yeah, shit. Yeah, and then that's like chaotic. Eight on eight, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a crash each race. Yeah. And that sort of that's shit. That's like that uh, Russian hip fighting. Did you ever see that shit on YouTube? Yeah. Where it was like They're a version of, yeah, a version of UFC, I guess, mixed martial arts, yeah. but it was almost like a gladiator type setup. Yeah. I think it's called... Russian hip fighting there, there HIP if you type that in YouTube but it was like big gladiator spec fucking There's objects set up they could hide behind and stuff yeah, yeah like yeah, a right. like a padded cube sitting yeah. on the ground that you would fucking get in these four on fours and then somebody would fall over the cube and then yeah. <laughs> it was just yeah. You're there, slug, you're there slugging it out in the pocket. Meanwhile, someone just comes with a fucking king head behind, like the left of you. They're wearing head, they're punch. wearing headgear, mind headgear, you. Granted, yeah. So it's headgear and not MMA gloves, but only in if, Russia. Yeah, if some, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> only in Russia. Some parts of fucking deep in Southeast Asia, maybe. <laughs> fucking, I don't know. Fuck me, man. What a fucking trip it's been for you, though, bro. And you're heading towards 2018 now. What sort of schedule do you have? in front of you in terms of preparation leading up to that is there some sort of like you mentioned with the athletics there was leagues leading up where you'd have to post qualifiers or mm. is there a qualifying process as such for a sport like snowboard, snowboard cross where you're racing someone yeah definitely so um we have the world cup which is in five different countries in europe and canada so northern hemisphere and then um we also have the world championships which is coming up in uh, big white in canada um in next is year that right, eh? but, yeah yeah um so every year we do travel so in athletics it's kind of like you train like nine months of the year and then you prepare for your international season and you go away for six weeks this sort of situation is more like you train non-stop and then you go away for you know up to five months yeah. like so you're always in the northern hemisphere and stuff when you, like when that. you say train are you spending is there cardio training and athletic training that goes with that, or you when you say training, you're in a f- you're binded into a <coughs> snowboard, just fucking going hard? Um, well, technique is the biggest thing when it comes to a snowboard. You can be fat and slow cardio and whatnot, but like right, I could snowboard, and then <laughs> someone can throw down. What like are you trying that. to say, man? <laughs> <laughs> it means I have sixteen no, five. I have, I have no <laughs> gas tank at all and would run. Uh, I said before that I could go a 16.5 on record. That fucking might be a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I've had some beers, so it's like, yeah, I could do that. But yeah. I've had five beers now. It's more like 18, 19, I reckon. With the spikes on a rubbery track? Yeah. I reckon what, you what get... Be real rubbery. I reckon you, <laughs> <laughs> you get to about 60 metres or that third flight of stairs and the, oh, and the yeah, legs would just say, hey, nah, man. Like, man. You have you have it, Usain 2.0. <laughs> you get it, bro. <laughs> No, I was comparing it to athletics because you couldn't get away without training. So it's like if you train hard in athletics, then yeah, you're up there. So, but in snowboarding, you could just be a really good rider and not even go to the gym and then kill everyone out in the snowboard. And it's definitely obvious in that sort of um, sport, which is pretty interesting. Um, but uh, there's a real interesting thing about board sports in that regard. You know, like I had mates when I was a little kid who for all of the fucking hours of practice that they wanted to put in on the on the surfboard or the skateboard they were never as good as you know my other mate who just happened to be naturally talented Uh, and and didn't didn't go for a surf for six months and then all of a sudden pick it up and just shred it's like it's this weird thing about board sports that um it's such a natural ability type thing like but uh, I guess that exists in all sports, you know. There's there's certain people who, you know, you got your Michael Bisping, so the, who's the hardest worker in the fucking room and, and ends up with the title just in the same way that, you know, your Anderson Silva, John. who's just a natural freak, mm. John Jones. Yeah, Jones, who, John who can Jones. go out and party his ass off and still rock up mm. on game day and get it done. Mm. Compared to a dude speaking like Bisping, of, who was grinded. Speaking like. of him, the suspension might not be as bad as first thought. What What's it's, that about? Are, are we talking six months? Are we talking less? I think they're trying to refer it back to, from what I've heard anyway, and this is all just alleged against him, he's had uh, this talk about him who's going to try and take the dick pill enhancer path where it's like, hey, yeah. it's a tainted supplement. I had a, I the had Anderson a, Silver model. I had a Viagra in the week leading up and there's a, there's a thing in, a chemical in that that comes up on the USADA drug test list, so he's gone that path. But and we'll never really know once that happens too. Yeah. It, w- it won't be that case, but... 
I know he had all that time off and he was doing that powerlifting and stuff, but geez, he's had some photos where he looked absolutely fucking jacked. In I've those seen those photos. Them. I've seen those comparison photos. And, and you've got to take that into, you know, reality is he would have just finished a, a bodybuilding spec session where he's pumping a heap of fucking blood into his mm. muscles. He's also sweaty and they've got good lighting on the photo. And no camp or anything. That's a valid yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not entirely like, uh, you know, obvious, but... Who knows? Who knows? Those guys, I think the, the the problem with the PED conversation is that it's, yes, it's cheating, but, um, and, and, and in a sport like fighting, it's such a fucking, it's such a divisive issue because it's, you know, you, you're dealing with people that are physically injuring each other and shit mm. like that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, you know, you can't discount the fact that these guys are working their fucking asses off man like even if they're taking some sort of Fuck thing yeah. it's like you don't get to the level that those guys are at physically without putting in the work that they do or having the natural ability that they do that's you know right I, mean? I think the, we were talking earlier about uh, Donald Cerrone being on the Joe Rogan experience this week and he makes a point where people are always coming up to him going man you're just a wild motherfucker you're always at the lake you're wakeboarding you're skydiving blah 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 he yeah. goes I just don't post training videos because I think it's fucking boring and it's yeah. my job. I'm doing way cooler shit than that to me. I'm there every fucking day. If I get home from the lake, I'm going to the gym at 2 a.m. that I've built on my property so I can do that. Yeah. So he's still getting the work. Here. That's a good point, Dan, too. Whether you're on the on the source or not, he's there working his ass off. But for Jones, if he does, in fact, take the tainted supplement route and does get it backdated, what UFC was 200, which he was stood down from, was in July... If he could get himself a six-month sentence, he's fucking good to go by New Year's, man. Mm. So, we whether he ends up going on to fight DC, I think DC has tried to Daniel Cormier for he's the UFC light heavyweight champion for the listeners who aren't up to date with UFC. But if he chooses to decline, DC chooses to decline, John. There's potential for an Anthony Johnson, John Jones contender fight. And that's a yeah, fucking that's an interesting. I want to see that. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I guess it probably wouldn't be a knockoff podcast episode without us fucking having some sort of PED chat. But it just so happened to <laughs> fucking, it just so happened to come up as we were sort of preparing for tonight's episode um, that there's a quite a high-profile high Paralympian that's just been busted for EPO. Is that correct, Simon? Well, that's what the report said. So I, it's allegedly. Yeah, it's allegedly. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, it's in, definitely in the Paralympics. Is that right? Yeah, so, do, do it's you, not the first time a high-profile athlete's been caught. Dur- during uh, London 2012, do you remember off the top of your head how many times you were drug tested? Is there a is there a WADA like the the World Anti Doping Authority? They they would be there testing. Is it mandatory for you to be tested? Do you remember pissing in a cup at all? Or um, so the situation is is like um, you got WADA. Exactly that, and the worldwide one, and then you got Asada, which is the Australian one. Um, yeah, definitely pre departure, I got tested before going into London and stuff. But um, I did walk away with a bronze medal, but I didn't do any um, testing at that time. Um, but definitely the person who came first and second got tested. So yep. um, it it it's there. It's definitely there. And it can happen anytime, anywhere, that's and that's how it works. And that's if yeah. you've got nothing to hide, it's no problem. It's no problem, right. man. And like I was listening to one of your podcasts um, yesterday, and it was exactly that. It's like which one, man? We've talked about PEDs on fucking all of them, man. We're <laughs> thinking about changing the name to the Roidcast, like fucking always talking about performance enhancers. But nah, it was the one where it's just like Asada could rock up to any time you want. So it was episode four. Yep. <clears throat> um. And it was a really good topic because, yeah, it definitely you, you can live in fear and do it or you could just have a clear conscience and just be like, you know, this is it. You That's know, th- this is what I've got. It. This is what I've got. Are living in fear of the knock at the door. Um, like, oh, fuck, they're here. Fuck. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Time, no, you can't live that life at that's all. That's right. But fucking plenty would, man. I bet you. Like, there's... I know if, uh, if we're talking Australian sports, the AFL has a st- three-strike policy for recreational violations. So I'd, I'd honestly be intrigued to see how many dudes are out there who have 
taken some sort of chemical or they've had some cannabis over the weekend with friends and any sort of just any roll sort of the thing. dice if you got three up your sleeve Absol- like and there would be fucking you could bet your <laughs> ass there would be dudes out there on two strikes yeah, there's man. um there's four chicks over here that want to have an orgy and uh they've got a whole bunch of um stuff yeah. <laughs> shout out Corey norman <laughs> <laughs> i ain't mad at you Corey. Uh, Fuck yeah man. we kept his we oh, kept his shit. name Pravado on uh on a, one of the earlier we episodes did. but shout out to the fanny video it was uh, <laughs> Corey, man. Fuck something me. else. Us here at the knockoff ain't mad at you, baby. <laughs> that was consensual shit that was happening in that room. So we hope you come back better than ever. He's a dude that's going fucking great guns with his footy. He's only re-signed with Parramatta this year uh, for, for another couple of years this week too. So put this shit behind you, big dog, and it's fucking onwards and upwards for uh, for the future for Corey Norman. But Yeah, and it was like uh, a fucking cowboy made a really, like a really good point about that whole role model athlete discussion that we've had yeah. on oh, this he, po- on this podcast he shot before. it down didn't he fucking he was like man. i'm not a fucking role model i'm here to kick dudes ass exactly like, if i wasn't getting paid for this i'd be th- that dude at the bar like f- fighting you over your misses and shit like that <laughs> See, you know he, what i mean went on record and said that he's like, like i'm not a fucking role model in this and i don't think we should necessarily hold any athlete to that standard you know they're they're admired for their athletic prowess and that's it like if if kids kids like i keep or i always use the fucking rock star example and it's like if kids want to idolize athletes if they want to idolize rock stars it shouldn't by default make those people role models that are then answerable to the fucking media of the uh, masses yeah like, like oh he did just, this he did that like, and you know the media shits me because journalists notoriously are the biggest fucking boozers and 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 druggies fucking out there like shout out hunter s thompson <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. Gon- gonzo <laughs> journalism like that's that's the fucking don't, don't that's even the mo to. in journalism and then and then they you know make a cross by getting fucking mitchell pierce to to do some phony baloney apology and yeah i mean that and people using literally i mean just the fucking thing with fucking <laughs> thing from this is me off the thing uh, i'm gonna start my own podcast and it's just gonna be what pisses danny off man, man. i'm just gonna fucking rant that, uh, negativity to everybody for an hour straight that fucking It'll just mitch, be me listening to myself that mitch pierce <laughs> mitch pierce thing fucking annoyed the shit out of me man i understand he had a a record a couple of alcohol incidents leading into that what he did was behind closed doors and basically got extorted by some fuckhead that shouldn't have done what he was doing by filming him on a camera phone and trying to sell it off to make a quick buck he was behind closed doors in private no one got hurt he and the key- si- simulated some <coughs> fucking sex act with a with a dog that didn't even fucking know what was going on and they stand him down for eight weeks and fine him a hundred thousand dollars. No, there was no there was no animal cruelty involved, no, no, not, like not nothing not whatsoever. Bit. Not and one the, bit. and the key word that you use there is extortion, because that's that's what happened in the Corey Norman instance, that's what happened in the Mitchell Pierce instance and Every time there's somebody out there that's looking to make a buck, whether it's the chick that didn't get the fucking text back or it's the dude who's jealous of this guy with all the attention at the party and it's like, these are the people and this is the behavior in in fucking, you know, human beings that it's like, it's the same shit as fucking people suing Maccas for cardiovascular disease. It's It's a bit of, I find it's a bit of tall poppy with Australian culture as well. It's like, no, no, this guy's on a pedestal. He's attaching some cash. I can get something out of this fucking guy. Doesn't doesn't sit well with me at all in terms of what either of those guys did. I understand it's not the fucking best look. I, I wouldn't want a video of me drinking a Canadian club out of a fucking A1 puss. Like, fucking <laughs> shout out. Like, well, let's call a spade a spade here. That fucking <laughs> calls are fucking nice, bro. Like, it was a, I wouldn't want a video of that out in public of me. But as I said before, everyone's consensual and everyone just decides to fucking throw this young guy under the bus like it, they've never done anything wrong in their lives or because it got leaked against his will that's it man like could you imagine if in one of the olympic villages if they you know it's it's almost like a joke amongst the media that that it's like oh you know the amount of condoms that we're handing out this olympics it, olympic season and there's no fucking cameras going through there bothering the athletes that are representing the country but as soon as it's like you know the fucking nrl or the ufc it's like let's hang these guys from the highest rope that we can find and 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 fucking rub their name in the mud and it's like if you if if you really want to fucking set an example for the kids, don't publish the shit. Fucking a. Don't fucking put it in the headlines. For, for mixed it's, martial. It's fu- you, you fucking present the story as this thing that's like, oh, you know, what kind of message is this sending to the kids? You're sending the message. 
That's They're it. not sending the fucking message. Exactly, this is man. like something that was recorded on a fucking iPhone 4 at 4 a.m. in the morning mm. in King's Cross or wh- whatever the fuck it was. And it's like, you're choosing to put this on the 6 o'clock news and show this to your fucking children. Yeah, right. right. I think that translates too to think about what it is with... So uh, mix, channel, mix, channel 9, if you want to have us on anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We, no, you, you might have we love r- News Corp, yeah. Rich, yeah. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch. Shout out Rupert. Shout out. Like, <laughs> okay, if you've got any spare time, we'd love to have you on. Like. All of a sudden, our shit just gets completely <laughs> disabled. Like We don't realise just how pervasive <laughs> yeah. that media <laughs> giant is. I can't log into iTunes, man. <laughs> I don't know. It says our password's fucked or something. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. But that's the thing, though. With You're talking about a professional cage fighter who gets hung out to dry for getting in a fucking car accident with strippers in his car. We're referring about John Jones when he crashed his Bentley and he had strippers in his car. But then we put him on a pedestal the next night because he bashed a guy within an inch of his life. Yeah. It's fucking... Yeah. Come on, man. Like, yeah. You're sending yeah. mixed signals to the young man. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, he, he's a human being just as well. But look, these fucking... You're allowed to make mistakes and it's fucking how you get better from them, which is the, which is the thing, but... Absolutely. You don't and I think necessarily ev- have to publicise that shit. You're dead right, Danny. That's it. And I think, you know, as human beings, that's that's what fucking living is. It's just continually making mistakes, learning from those mistakes, doing a little better. And I don't think that athletes or anybody for that matter should be treated as if, oh, you need to be above this. You need to be ab- above this animal behaviour that journalists, that fucking whoever you are, we're all capable of the same shit. And if... If you're somebody reporting on that and and denying, like, I don't know, I get it, I get it, you know, we're doing this podcast, we're essentially doing a media thing where we're we're discussing these issues and, and the whole sort of ethics behind journalism is to present things in an unbiased manner and... uh I get it. I get that, you know, it, it's a topic of conversation to talk about. But um, the the thing that I guess I have the problem I- with is the fucking, won't somebody please think of the children? Like yeah. that, that sort of outrage in regards to these sort of topics and stuff. And it's like, okay... You, you know, fucking. <coughs> let's let's see all the, all of your past mistakes laid yeah. out on the table, like Definitely you know, fucking slamming these peop- people, like people you've in never glass houses. Exactly, That's all I can man. Say. Like you've never done fucking anything wrong in your life. I mean, fucking give us an absolute break. Well, yeah, I'm not sure how we got on that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, no, we've had a couple of beers and fuck this shit, man. Fuck I'm against this. authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking throw the media under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't that under the bus anyone this week actually so the, yeah other than the, Canberra and yeah. Adelaide and uh, uh, the yeah. entire news media yeah. and um, sorry Rupert I'm <laughs> sure we accused some people of uh, performance enhancing drugs at some point us, yeah, yeah. <laughs> shout out to that alleged Paralympian that we just fucking haggard <laughs> even <laughs> good thing we didn't mention a name though so no. if your name's cleared buddy yeah all G all G we're happy to forget about it if you do man it's fucking no, nothing personal listen Simon, fucking, it's been an out and out pleasure having you on, man. You're <laughs> you're fucking a long term friend of ours here at the knockoff, and you've lived a hell of a life to this point. You're fucking 29. You've got a hell of a lot under your belt at this point. You've been to competed professionally across sports that I can only imagine going to. Uh, that's not to say that it's the end of the line, man. Hand on heart, you have my absolute blessing to get to 2018 Pyeongchang, South Korea, and. Uh, Hope to see you sliding down on that snowboard as quick as we can uh, once that meat rolls around, man. Fucking, you good dude. Thanks for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. Peace out, folks. We'll uh, we'll catch you next week. Oh, oh! Thank you.